edition of the Gramophone podcast. I'm Martin Cullingford, editor of Gramophone, and today I'm delighted to be joined by Richard Boothby, leading viol player and a founding member of the acclaimed viol consort Fretwork. Richard, hello. Well, thank you for inviting me. I'm delighted to be here. Now, we're here to talk about your wonderful new album of works by Alfonso Ferrabosco called Music to Hear. It's a collection of music for Lira Viol from 1609. Now, the Lira Viol, Hard to define, easy to recognise, as you put it in the very helpful <laughs> booklet notes. At once an instrument, a style of playing, and a genre of music. So let's start there. Set the context. What is the lira viol? Yeah. Okay. So, um, so the the viol itself um, starts at the bit, about a century before the lira viol arrives in, in the beginning, end of the fifteenth century, and by the beginning of the so sort of the end of the the sixteenth century in England. That there was still this this uh, this this desire to to go back to to Greek um, uh, the, to the ancient way of reciting poetry, and they had this lyre which they they played with the reciting poetry. So the the idea of 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 looking at that and finding an instrument that would fit was the the the, the sort of genesis of the idea of the lyre vial, and. Uh, it seems that um, the the uh, earliest instruments that were used for this were were small bass files, and some of them had um, uh, sympathetic strings, uh, like like a viola de more, uh, running through the fingerboard underneath the bridge, that sort of thing. Um, the first uh, mention of the lyre viol is in a play by Ben Johnson, uh, Cynthia's Revel, Revels, and. It's quite likely that Ferrabosco was the guy playing it in that play because Ben Johnson and Ferrabosco were were very close. Uh, Ferrabosco wrote most of the music for most of um, uh, Johnson's masks and some of his plays as well. So there's a big theatrical um, connection there. Um, the, the, the defining feature, I suppose, in some ways of the lira viol is that it has altered tuning. So that instead of the standard bass viol tuning, there were many, many different. And, and over the century or so of its life, it chalked up around sixty different tunings, which are, you know, some of which are sort of absolutely crazy. <laughs> and, uh, but um, uh, so that that forced the the use of uh, what's called tablature. So whereby you don't have five lines for the music, you have six lines, and each line represents a string. And then the frets are given letters, so an A is an open string, B is the first fret, C, and so on. And uh, then the rhythm is, is notated on the top. So <clears throat> the, the pitch of, so for a solo instrument, certainly, the pitch is irrelevant, it's just the relationship between the strings which you tune and then the the frets themselves so it's um, uh, so that's one of the defining things but you know there's and so many why did it have so many different tunings was it just just to let composers to be able to write for different di- different sorts of sound worlds they were trying to create or? Uh, it's a very good question <laughs> the one, the one I hadn't really thought about but but actually uh, I mean one of the things about the different tunings is is to explore the the resonance of the instrument. So when you've got a lot of open strings that are in, so, so that what tends to happen is that you have a tuning f- fixed to a particular key. So I, I mean, on this record, but on uh, Ferrabosco's uh, original publication, there are three different tunings, and each one gives you a, a different key in which you play. So. Uh, you, you, you're not absolutely stuck in, in that key because, of course, you, you've got frets, so you can move things around. Ferrabosco is very inventive in the way he uh, modulates to slightly different, you know, quite distant keys. But uh, it does give you the resonance of the home key, bang, you know, that, 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 that's very strong. And then when you move away, it, it, the, the resonance is withdrawn from that, you know. So, but, but, uh, you know, I suppose one of the things you could say is that the, uh, the, the, the different tunings allow for different chords with different chord shapes. Um, and so a lot of the composers were thinking about 
you know, what would be an easy chord shape for that sort of chord, that sort of thing, and then and then arranging a, a tuning for that. Mm. Ha- that said, there, there were, uh, you know, a, a small bunch of really popular tunings. I mean, Ferrovosco's three, and then later in the century, a few more, uh, slightly more uh, uh, different ones as well. Mm. Um, so, th- although there were 60 in total, probably, you know, 10 were the, were the favourites. <laughs> To continue the theatrical link, you, you rather wonderfully suggest that the, the Lear of Arles might have laid behind a line in Shakespeare's eighth sonnet. Mark how one string, sweet husband to another, strikes each in each by mutual ordering, and presumably that's the sympathetic strings that it's Indeed, yeah, to, yeah, which is rather lovely, I think, as a thought. Well, I mean, it, 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 it's you know, it's not, and never with Shakespeare, it's always very <laughs> sort of you know, you can't pin it right down, but that's where the title comes from, music to hear, which is the first line of that sonnet. Yeah, and um, and I. And I was struck by the fact that the sonnets were published the same year as, as Ferrovosco's uh, publication, mm. uh, and that there were other, other um, uh, links to Shakespeare as well, um, because, because the, the dedicatee of the, of the publication is the same as the Earl of Southampton, is the same he- Henry Rossley, who's the same uh, dedicatee of the first two Shakespeare uh, um, sonnet, uh, not sonnet, po- poem sequences, um, Venus and Adonis, and, and the other one I can't remember at the moment. But uh, but he's been posited as as the only begetter of the sonnets as well. Right. Uh, so that's quite that's quite um, you know. Quite, and also, of course, Shakespeare and Johnson were were known to each other. Shakespeare played in some of Johnson's plays when Fair of Oscar may well have given given the, uh, pl- played the music or composed the music. So. That it's a it's a very, I mean, you know, it's a tight world, the the, the world of theatre and court, music and theatre in London in yeah. in that in those years, yeah. so that, that I'm sure they knew each other. But, yeah. but it's fascinating to, to to think of this figure just being so sort of embedded in that that world that is known known so well. I mean, let's mm. talk a little bit about Alfonso Ferrabosco. Mm. Um, born in Greenwich, never left England, um, d- despite his name suggesting he, he might have been Italian, but his father was, was Italian. From yes, Italian. well, his father was a, was a wonderful composer, a very significant composer, sort of mid-16th mid century, and he came to England um, and, you know, was a, quite a favoured composer by, by Elizabeth and brought, you know, very... Um, it's a slightly austere um, uh, style, but but it's very, it's got great integrity to to his style, uh, and he wrote some, he wrote quite a few cons- pieces of console music, which were which are great. One wonderful piece is called for, for six bass files, and uh, it's it's it's, uh, it's a fantastic thing to play because his sonority is amazing. Six bass files together. Sure. Um, but um, so he left. Uh, he so he came to England, married uh, an English woman, and uh, gave birth to our Alfonso, and then wanted to go back to Italy to Bologna. And uh, Elizabeth said, "You must leave your son here as security." Right. So, and he went and never came back. And but both of them went. And so our Alfonso was brought up uh, by another member of the um, uh, of the musical fraternity of, of the court. A rather sad yeah. um, start to life, you know. But but he, he was only one when they left, so he he had no presumably no memory of his uh, of his biological parents at all. It's extraordinary uh, idea then this figure who who just just grew up within the musical life of yes. of London of the court. Yes, yes, yes. Uh, 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 and 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 uh, you know he obviously became one of the great VAR players of the of the era and. Uh, and that and that's quite significant, you know, because because at the time English viol players were considered the best in the world, and you know they they travelled throughout Europe earning g- good money, I'm sure, mm-hmm. in the courts of Europe, uh, uh, and were renowned as, as as the great players of the of the instrument uh, in the first half of the 17th century. Yeah, there's a great 
Quiz. Yeah, Andre Mogar, yeah. Yes, yeah, so, so that's right. A, a visitor who said that uh, there's no liar in Italy who was fit to be compared with the great Fauro Bosco d'Angleterre. <laughs> works. So mm. Lessons for One, Two and Three Vols, published in, in 1609. And right, I'm thinking they're, they're essentially sort of dance suites, aren't they? Yes, yes, they're, 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 they're just three preludes uh, and all the rest are dance, move, uh, dance pieces, either uh, pavans, almains or galliards and corantos. And it's, it's interesting the way in which he arranges it because the, you see the original population is a full scat thing. So you get uh, an almain pavan or galliard in the first top bit of the page and at the bottom there's the coranto and the coranto is very often a kind of um, uh, a parody of what you've just played. It, it, it uses the same material and turns it into triple time um, if it's, uh, if it's a, an Almain or a Pavan and, um, uh, and it, tur it turns very often something that's quite serious, quite sort of heavy and serious into something quite jocular and light. And it's fascinating that, that, that I mean, I've never heard of that uh, being done before, but I, it's a bit like, I suppose, a Pavel and Galliard, where the, the material is the same, but, but sort of translated into a different time and a different mood. But this is, this is you know, uh, almost all the pieces have that same arrangement, um, which is interesting, yeah. Yeah, and how would, what, would the, what was the music written for? How would it have been heard? Where, what place would it have had? Well, uh, that's a very good question. I, I mean, I, th I think that the, the Lira, I mean, what, what's interesting that it was published at all, first of all, because the Lira had taken off at the beginning, this first decade, first 15 years of the century, the Lira had a certain vogue, and we see all the publications there, but um, uh, there, there's, there's only, there's, well, I mean, only Ferrabosco produces a single uh, publication with nothing but Lira music in it. Mm -hmm. uh, all the others uh, have various other bits and pieces, some songs, uh, uh, that sort of thing. But it's only Ferrabosco who produces this, and it's a really weighty volume. We've got 101 pieces altogether, yeah. um, and and they're really difficult. I mean, they are very, very challenging. Um, and, uh, that, you know, that says something about the, the state of VAR playing in England at the time, that he was proposing to, to sell this to make a profit on it yes. and, and he there must have been I, I, we've no idea how many were sold but you know it's quite something that there were people to play it and and i think that um it, you know that probably the the the, the, the way in which far playing worked in the 16th century in england was that initially it's it's a court instrument it's professional players in the first sort of first 50 years of the century and then gradually through through the end of the 16th century it becomes a a very popular amateur instrument and you see the the, the part books starting to appear uh, at the end of the uh, towards the end of the century where, where amateur players are playing console music and then they're obviously beginning you know this is this is a uh, the, the Lyraval is the opportunity to play solo and the great thing about the Lyraval is that it, it, it's it's a complete musical thing you know, if you if you think forward to the Bach um, uh, solo partitas and the cello suites and so on, those are complete musical expressions with just one single instrument, one single string instrument. And the lyre of is a prefigurer of that in in many ways. He he attempts to create everything unique in melody, harmony, and rhythm uh, uh, with one one single string instrument. Mm. And um, and uh, that, that's one of the reasons why they're so challenging. He he tries to cram as much in, you know, as possible, and um, I, I, you know, so um, so yeah. But it's it's an interesting sort of line of development from from there to Bach, I think. Yeah, yeah that that is very interesting. <laughs> Use the 
were challenges there. Talk about the particular challenges of performing and recording this today on, 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 on your instrument. I suppose the first thing to say is that the, the instrument itself, uh, the, as I say, there was evidence of, of these instruments having sympathetic strings. There, there, are, there have been a few made in the, in the last um, 10, 10, 20 years with sympathetic strings. Unfortunately, I don't have, I don't have one, and um, uh, uh, I would have, would have liked to have tried it on, on, on such an instrument. I didn't have access to one, but I, that wasn't a reason to not to do it, I don't think. Um, I was able to borrow an instrument from uh, a friend who had just the right kind of size instrument. What we're looking at is, is, a, is a relatively small bass file um, and uh, something, well, we, we all strung in gut, uh, as, as they all would, would have been at the time. Yes, yeah, so the decisions were, were, you know, what pieces to play, first of all, um, and secondly, uh, tuning what pitch I should, I should try. The, 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 there are three different tunings, uh, and the third tuning is the widest, so that the, there's high note the, the, the lowest and the biggest distance between those two and when you've got all gut strings you don't want the bottom note to be too low because that means your bottom string is going to be very fat um, and it'll it'll won't sound well on the other hand there's there's a limit to how high you can go um, so normally a bass file has a d as a top string which is uh, just the d above middle c and, and i choose to prove, prove it up a a third, so the top string is F, uh, and that gives me the bottom string and the third tuning of a C, which is absolutely feasible. And uh, and so I've, that, that that was those are the decisions I had to make about which tuning and, and mm. um, what what strings. Uh, you know how you have to change strings in order to make the the highest and lowest notes work properly and that sort of thing. So there was quite a lot of messing around. Unfortunately, there was a lot of time on my hands at the time because of because of lockdown. Right. But, uh, okay. So this was just... You could immerse yourself. What more better time to explore solo? solo yes, exactly. Well. Yes, yes. Uh, so you chose a, a bass file which you felt sort of replicated what a like, little yeah. while might have been like in terms of size, resonance, shape, obviously without the sympathetic string. Yes. yes. And the, the, the actual sort of notion of playing it would have been the same. Um, yeah, well, well that, that, that was a big, that was a, quite a learning experience as well, because um, uh, the, 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 one of the most difficult things about the Lira Viola is the density of chords that you're asked to play, and Ferro is the, is the hardest in that respect. He asks, he asks for a lot of chords and a lot of notes in those chords, you know, so you get quite a lot of uh, passages where you're playing uh, you know, three note chords. You know, in mm. in, re in relatively quick succession, and that's uh, and it it changes the left hand technique um, from uh, if you're playing you know the, the more running passages, you might you might have a what what a cellist would regard as first position. Um, so not one finger per uh, so one finger finger per fret, but uh, starting on the second fret, that sort of thing. So it gives you the option of either playing an open string or a fourth finger, that sort of thing. With these more dense chords, the, the hand is crushed so much so that you, you, you're you using um, the, the, the fourth and the third finger on lower frets to produce uh, a, a more densely packed f finger uh, hand position right. in order to cope uh, what one's trying to do is to maintain lines in the in the music, so that the bass line, for example. So you need to hold a note down while you're playing something else, so that the resonance carries on. And in order to do that, if you're using, for example, your first finger on one fret, you've now only got three fingers for the rest of them. So you tend to be using the fourth finger and the third finger for uh, melodic work, which you might uh, otherwise not do. Mm. So um, those are, you know, they're, they're very technical <laughs> sort yeah, of things. Right. Yeah. You described it very, very well. <laughs> and is that something specific to Ferro Bosco's approach to writing, or, or is that again just something that's that's, that's characteristic of Lira Vial? Uh, yeah, I, th I mean, the, the other the other player, the other writers for for the Lira Vial tend to use well in different circumstances, but I mean, Corkine is another another uh, composer, uh, 
deeply unknown composer, but, but he wrote two, two books with Lyraval stuff in it, and they're quite flashy, they're, 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 they're easier to play, but sound more virtuosic, because they're more conventional in, in the running, in the, the passage work that's required, less dense chords, mm. um, uh, but, uh, but uh, the chords are less dense and there are fewer of them, and uh, it's, a, it's a slightly more open uh, thing. With Ferrabosco, there's a, there's a real difficulty. The difficulty is to try and convey the sense of the rhythmic pulse, uh, uh, particularly in the galliards, which are moving relatively quick, mm. um, uh, and, and not, to, not to get bogged down in the, in the detail of the, of the chords. <laughs> Beautifully resonant. Tell me about where you did it and why you chose that, that space in the, the process. Oh well, that's good. Um, well, it's my local church, actually. Um, this <laughs> Ideal. <is> very convenient, <laughs> you know. So, yeah. and actually, uh, it is very convenient because um, Nick Parker, who's the producer for one of the days, and Adrian Hunter, they live uh, in, in Charlbury, not not uh, you know, sort of about half an hour's drive away. So everybody was happy with that. <laughs> yeah. um, no, it's, it's, a, it's a very nice um, sort of mid-19th century church, and we've used it for several fretwork recordings as well. Uh, so, so they both, uh, both producers know it quite well. Mm. And um, uh, yeah, it was, um, it was very, very nice. Um, and, and it's good to record in the summer. I think we were in June, July. Right. So it's warm, you don't need to heat it. And uh, there's, yeah, it's... Yeah, uh, very good. Yeah, and for this album of the hundred or so works in the book that you could have chosen from, you've given us about an hour or so of music. Do you think you'll do more? Is there more you'd like to explore? Yeah, essentially. <laughs> yeah, no, I would. I would love to. I mean, um, I, it's it's um, first of all, uh, we recorded a couple of uh, some some of the the vile duos which are there. Yes, yeah. Um, uh, with Asiko, which is which are you know wonderful fun and and a, and a bit of a relief in a solo album to to because the the the, the duet album the pieces are not nearly so difficult because you're not having to carry the whole thing you know so that the, the work is is shared um and there are two wonderful pieces for three vials which um uh, we, I didn't think we could we could achieve in in this one. so so there, uh, I mean if it if it goes well I mean we, we, may, <laughs> we may we may we may get the chance to do another one which right. would be which would be great I hope so I look forward to it. Hmm. well music to hear music for Lyraval from sixteen oh nine by Alfonso Ferrabosco and performed by my guest today Richard Boothby is available now on the Signum Classics label Richard thank you so much for telling us all about it oh my pleasure thank you. Viola de Gamba, concluding our podcast and indeed his new album of the music of Alfonso Ferrabosco. Called Music to Hear, it's available on the Signum label and reviewed in the June issue of Gramophone. If you've enjoyed this Gramophone podcast, we'd be hugely grateful if you could leave a rating or a review, hit the subscribe button or simply tell your friends about our work. And if you want to explore classical music in even greater depth with Gramophone, then we produce a monthly magazine packed full of interviews, features and reviews. And all listeners to this podcast can get a 20% discount by visiting gramophone.co.uk forward slash subscribe and entering the code podcast20 at the checkout. Thank you for listening and do join us again for another Gramophone podcast next week.